Hello everyone. Welcome to Wednesday's Compass Seminar. Today we have Emily Becker speaking to us. She is the Associate Director of CMIS and also an Associate Research Scientist here at the Rosenstiel School. This year she has new PhD students she's advising and she also is a lead writer for the ENSO blog from climate.gov and she has been a mentor for the student-run um, Season Chaos blog that former and current members of the Kurtman group run. So if we could welcome her today, she'll be talking about the path to climate prediction. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Victoria. All right, great to see you all. I live in Maryland, so it's been a very gradual process over the last four years of uh, meeting people, but. I'm starting to recognize a lot of people. It's great to, to be in the same room with all of you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the, uh, the path to climate prediction. Um, I came up with this because my experience really ranges from basic research all the way to um, operational climate prediction. Um, and I'm going to define some of the terms that I'm using um, over the next few slides, but uh, that's that's the theme along the path from one end to the other, and then of course it turns out it's actually um, a circle, a feedback loop. So this is kind of a fun exercise. I thought, can I distill my, my work areas into uh, a Venn diagram? Um, so uh, maybe it worked, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, climate prediction, so I will define what I mean by climate prediction in this sense, but um, this is applied climate predictions, so initialized predictions, the probability of certain outcomes, um, rather than climate change projections, which is actually a, a topic, an emerging topic for me, um, but up until now, uh, it's primarily been climate prediction, um, seasonal, sub-seasonal, seasonal, uh, to multi-year prediction, and then climate diagnostics. So what does the data tell us about how the climate system works and, um, and what influences certain patterns, what's the source of certain patterns and so on. And then of course, and so El Nino, Southern Oscillation, um, really the big dog for anybody who's working on climate. There are a couple seats way up in the front. <laughs> so. Um, and where those intersect for me practically um, are two projects, the NMME, the North American Multimodel Ensemble, and the ENSO blog. So both of those I'm going to talk about. Um, the funny thing about this, this image here is one of the best seminars I ever saw, um, the guy only had three slides, and one of them was a nitrogen molecule, so there were, there were two circles, not three. Um, and I thought, could I pull that off? And I decided, no, I definitely could not pull it off. So we have way more than three slides here. Um, but I just, uh, this made me think of this nitrogen molecule. Anyway, all right, so, hi Amy. What do I mean about climate, for climate prediction? So climate prediction, probabilistic information on the range of potential future climate conditions. Uh, climate, as I said, in this uh, context for me is couple of weeks out to several years into the future um, over varying averages. So what I'm showing right here is um, a figure we have from the ENSO blog, but it, uh, this shows you the probability of certain outcomes here. And this is pretty generalized and simplified, but the, uh, you have your, your model average in the middle, that's your most probable outcome, and then within certain ranges, uh, you have one standard deviation, two standard deviations. So this is just uh, a sort of first order climate prediction for El Nino. This is our, um, it was our forecast in September. We're about to update this. Um, and the ENSO forecast that NOAA produces, I'm still on that team. So every month we ingest all the data, we look at all the different factors and uh, we have a team of 11 people and together we come up with a consensus forecast. Uh, this is just one of the things that we look at. This is not that actual forecast, um, but just an example of what I mean for climate prediction. Where one of the major tools we have for, the, for climate prediction is initialized ensemble models. So ensemble models, a, a climate model where you give it a picture of what's happening right now. Um, 
So it's grounded in reality, and then it, it gives you the range of, of potential outcomes. So this is uh, a model that we run here at UM. It's uh, the CCSM4, one of NCAR's models. And each of those purple lines is an individual model run. So from those, you can get the range of potential outcomes. The broader that envelope, the um, wider your range of uncertainty, the broader your range of potential outcomes. And then I just show this for reference in the you know, 3.4 region if you're not, um, you know, you don't eat, sleep, and drink. And so like some of us do, um, is that's our, our key monitoring region for El Nino. Kind of a fun time right now for an ENSO predictor because um, unless you have not been paying any attention, which I don't know if I blame you, but <laughs> if you haven't been, uh, we are cooking up one of the larger El Nino events we've had in a long time, um, and it was beautifully predicted. Our models and our consensus forecast started uh, predicting this event uh, a year ago. And so that's a pretty good time range. We, we didn't oh, nail the magnitude of it a year ago, but the fact that a, an El Nino event was going to develop, um, we, we had pretty strong probabilities of that. Uh, so we spent so much time looking at ENSO uh, because it is predictable several months in advance and uh, its global teleconnections make seasonal prediction possible. Um, that and climate change trends are the, uh, the two greatest sources of information that we have. There are many others um, and we are constantly coming up with, with new little clues for seasonal prediction but this is really the the major predictor, and even though uh, ENSO was discovered, well, by Peruvian fishermen hundreds of years ago, but by scientists um, many, many decades ago, we are still learning an awful lot about it. So due to those global teleconnections, so you, El Nino has impacts on um, weather and climate around the world. Um, that's what makes seasonal prediction possible. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how that works a bit later. Okay. So now it's time to talk about the NRME, the North American Multimodel Ensemble. A, um, a clue to the pronunciation, if you hit the N really hard, NMME, it comes out sounding a little less like enemy. Uh, so you know, just uh, if you happen to be talking about it, it started out the National Multimodel Ensemble. Um, and then in our second year, uh, which was 2012, the uh, Canadian uh, in environmental, uh, environment, they've changed the name, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, they joined us with their seasonal coupled models and then we changed it to the North American Multimodel Ensemble. This uh, is led by University of Miami, but it's a very collaborative project. Uh, ben is the original PI and has um, led this project for the last 12 years. Uh, we've had hundreds of papers published uh, by everybody around the world, it's created a tremendous research database. Uh, why did we start the NMME? Multi-model ensembles, so an ensemble of ensemble models. Uh, each of those colored lines in there is an individual model's ensemble, um, have been shown to produce more successful predictions than any single model, even a model with this equivalent number of ensemble members. Um, and that is in part due to error cancellation and signal concentration, um, and also to the ability to characterize uncertainty. So the more ensemble members you have, the more accurate your envelope of potential outcomes is. Um, so this was the, the enemy initialized in September, the beginning of September, for that Nino 3.4 forecast. So this is, a, again, an input into the the ENSO forecast. Just an example of one of the, the uh, of a precip uh, precipitation forecast. This is uh, a bit prettier than the figures that go on the Climate Prediction Center's website, but it's all the same information. Uh, so you get the probability of wetter conditions, probability of drier conditions, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, there's a huge 
research database that has resulted from the NMME. Each of the models that participate are required to uh, come to the project with a 30-year set of retrospective forecasts. So they run the model for um, the past times so that we can verify it and, uh, and do bias correction, things like that. Um, and since we've been in continuous operation since 2011, every month, um, that original 30 years has extended to over 40 years now. Uh, we've had 17 models and counting. The, uh, the, we have a continuous uh, evolution built into the NMME, so we retire older models, introduce newer models. And so as of now, uh, we only have one model that has continued all the way from 2011 to the present. Um, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, there have been hundreds of research papers published using NMME data. All right, last sort of background information I wanted to provide is uh, the ENSO blog. As Victoria mentioned, this project also started a while ago, 2014, when we were anticipating the, uh, the strong El Nino that occurred in 2015, 2016. It took a little longer than we thought. We thought it was going to develop in 2014, but it came around anyway. Uh, and a colleague of mine, Michelle LaRue, at the Climate Prediction Center was fielding so many media inquiries about this. And she thought, well, there's so much hunger for information that would go beyond just the very technical dis uh, discussion that the, uh, the Climate Prediction Center puts out. So she approached climate.gov, which is a, a, a part of NOAA, um, about creating this, this blog. and. It has, uh, I think we're all surprised that we're still, oh, you know, we're nine, we're going on 10 years in, and we've been through El Nino events and La Nina events and continuous La Nina events and neutral years. We still have a lot to say. Um, we still have new concepts we want to discuss, and we've got a list um, of dozens of, we do two posts a month. We've got a list of dozens of ideas. Um, and for example, I was at uh, my, I was at a family wedding a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to my, my mom's cousin's wife, you know, the way you do at a family wedding. Turns out she's a, a, a lemur scientist and so uh, she spends a lot of time in Madagascar, which actually has a pretty substantial El Nino impact. And so El Nino has an impact on lemurs and she's going to write a guest blog post for us about these, <laughs> these lemurs and what happens to them as a consequence of El Nino. So, if you ever have any interest in writing a guest post, we would love it. And um, it really only has to be tangentially associated with it. And so if it's in the climate region, whatever, that's, that's good enough. We, uh, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of readers with an average time on page of about four minutes. So people are actually reading our posts. Um, so yeah, please, if you're interested, we, uh, we're always always looking for fun ideas. And um, as Victoria mentioned, we also have the Seasoned Chaos blog, our, our younger sister maybe. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check that out, that's amazing. They do all, we have professional people do our graphics and they are not as good as the Seasoned Chaos ones. Since my graphics people are not here, I can say that. I wanted to give some examples of those because, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on our scientific figures, but they are for communicating amongst us. Um, they are not necessarily for communicating to the broader public, to teachers and to uh, students in other disciplines and so on. So um, these, these graphics are designed to communicate concepts uh, rather than um, you know, statistical outcomes. So this is our, our how, why does the NMME work? It's the crowdsourcing concept. Um, yes, it's a little simplified. It definitely does not contain the amount of complexity that multi-model ensembles truly do, but it conveys to somebody who may not have uh, much of a physical science background why looking at six models gives you a better picture. Um, and up at the Top there we have our flow chart about how to tell whether El Nino is in effect or not. Um, and then this down here at the bottom, I think Brianna and Mary Beth should recognize. 
they wrote a guest blog post for us on Rosby waves, which was fantastic. What a difficult concept to translate in 1,200 words to something um, that a high school science teacher could read and understand and convey to his class. Like I said, guest blog posts. All right. Um, I could talk about the ENSO blog, NMME, all those things for hours, uh, but instead I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a couple of science questions that have really um, had through lines in my work um, over the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, for context, yes, I've been uh, here at Rosenthal for, uh, and CMIS for four years. Before that, I spent 10 years at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center as a contract research scientist. Um, so that was my, my hands-on experience with the operational prediction side of things. Um, I was fortunate while I was there to be able to get a lot of basic science research done on climate prediction, um, which allowed me to kind of continue some of those lines of research that I'd established in grad school and carry them through to now. And one of those has been uh, trying to understand the variability of daily temperature and precip, so essentially weather within a season. So this is your, your weather climate, um, your weather climate intersection. And how do shifts in climate translate down to your daily, um, you know, your daily impact. That's where we're really going to feel climate change is on the seasonal time scale. Uh, you, can, you can withstand a day or two of a heat wave, but if you have 20 or 40, and I know I'm talking to people who just went through the summer here, um, that really can strain resources and such. So trying to understand the mechanics behind that. Um, and how does ENSO, in, how does ENSO um, influence those characteristics as well? Um, and how might this change in a future climate? Okay, so here's my, uh, from the ENSO blog, graphic of how El Nino and La Nina affect climate over North America. These are just uh, general patterns, though. You're, you're likely to have a warmer than average winter uh, during El Nino in the northern half of North America and so on. Uh, this doesn't really get into those, uh, those daily shift, those shifts in the, the PDF of daily precip and such. Um, and then just to, in a very, very shorthand way, uh, these, are the, these shifts in the jet stream are how El Nino's and La Nina's impacts are communicated remotely over thousands of miles. All right, so this, uh, this paper I was uh, I revisited a little bit from grad school. Um, how do, just looking at pure data analysis study, um, how does ENSO influence daily precip within a season? So this was the first one of these studies. I did, um, so red is where the frequency in the top one, the frequency of daily precip, so rains more often during the season, um, increases, blue is where it decreases. Why I chose red and blue, I don't know. Um, ask me from 15 years ago. Uh, and then this is the intensity of precip, so where it's red, you see higher, um, oh, I know red, blue. Huh. Sorry, I figured that out. Okay, so blue is uh, where it's more intense slash frequent during La Nina, because these are the difference between El Nino and La Nina. All right, well, thanks for helping me figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so we have greater frequency and intensity of precip through the southeast, um, but over most of the country, we do not see those matching patterns. They don't go hand in hand. Um, so we will see an increase, uh, uh, a reduction, for example, of the intensity in, um, in precip uh, through the Ohio Valley, but no matching change in intensity. Um, and then frequency, uh, those, those are actually flipped the words there, but anyway. So my point is that uh, we see these, these different shifts in the, the patterns that have uh, different consequences down the road. So why are they different? Uh, this again uh, is the jet stream. I, I just wrote this post about the jet stream in the ENSO blog 
uh, a week ago, and it was the most challenging post I have ever written. I realized you have to essentially cram everything about uh, atmospheric dynamics into 1,200 words, and that was tricky. So um, I wanted to use these figures because they took a lot of work, but ultimately they're not very satisfying because you can barely see the difference. But anyway, you can see there's a slight shift in the jet core here. This is the, the mechanism throughout uh, which these changes in intensity and precip, so changes in the PDF of precip, are uh, communicated. This extension of the subtropical jet that you see and the, the southward displacement that you see changes moisture flux, flux convergence patterns and therefore the amount of uh, precip available um, decreased in the Ohio Valley region, increased throughout the southeast. Uh, okay, so I go from that to something we just submitted, a colleague of mine, Mike Tippett, uh, up at Columbia, um, he and I just did this, uh, looking at the seasonal characteristics of daily temperature. Uh, this idea actually came out of an ENSO blog post that I did, um, looking at the shift in the standard deviation of daily temperature. There's not a lot of, there are not a lot of studies of daily temperature, but these, uh, if you see extremes in temperature, that's where they're that's where they're really felt. So uh, we were inspired to look at this. Uh, Mike came up with a way to uh, use segmented linear regression. So uh, you end up with uh, being able to separate the impacts of the uh, positive above average uh, warm ENSO conditions, cool ENSO conditions, and the trend here. Uh, so these are all independent assessments, and therefore you can uh, really examine the asymmetries that appear. Um, this, uh, this is uh, a little bit of a baseline study that we did ahead of something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but just uh, that, that, that thread of looking at shifts in the PDF continues. Uh, all right, um, and then this is a different approach to looking at uh, the predictability of daily precip using explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, so these are machine learning models. We, uh, our colleague, Kathy Pajon, led this study. Um, she developed machine learning models uh, to, to study the, how, what made, what was the most successful model? If you put in climate indices, so, and so, MJO, NAO, she threw the entire uh, alphabet soup at these models uh, and couldn't get, you see the, these, these flat lines here, the reliability was terrible, these models simply did not work, they could not predict uh, the sign of daily precip over the southeast U.S. of, of the precip anomaly. Uh, so <coughs> Instead, she tried putting in models that ingest full fields, uh, so geopotential heights, winds, uh, sea level pressure, and so on, and found that these were much more successful, uh, especially using a, a convolutional neural network model that captures nonlinear relationships. So this is a really interesting uh, study that uh, we're looking forward to kicking off a lot of new projects. Um, we just have a, a newly funded project that Ben's going to talk about on uh, Friday at, where we'll be using some of these tools to diagnose uh, predictability of daily events. So I thought this sentence was kind of interesting. Even when precipitation events are explained or attributed to large-scale climate mechanisms, that attribution does not necessarily translate to prediction. So that's so we can say, well, you know, ENSO caused this, or N NAO was positive, and therefore we saw this pattern. But even if you can diagnose that in an attribution framework, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have those identical index conditions, again, that you're going to see the same impact. Yeah? Is that the model's prediction of the modes and the full fields, or is this putting in information about the... That's an excellent question. So the first, this study, putting in the information, yeah. but what we'd like to go to next is looking at the prediction of those fields and if that 
is a prediction, like if that follows through with prediction. Yeah, exactly. Because this this is a even more kind of a fake framework because you know what the the situation is. Yeah. So when once you go to predict, so that's that's one of the follow ups we're doing with our new we're learning projects. So thank you. Yes, I, I'm glad I got a chance to talk about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, this. Project should look familiar to Mary Beth because she wrote a very nice paper about it. Um, so this is a um, this is a daily impact, a daily pattern that uh, is is new. But we've got lots of new projects looking at, at coastal flooding. So can we predict the number of coastal flooding days per season? And this study that Mary Beth did. Um, she found that there were robust relationships between the phase of ENSO and the phase of the MJO and the number of coastal inundation, the number of flooding days at uh, the various tide gauges, which are highlighted here. So um, it's, a, it's a very compelling study. And I think uh, all of us who are working on this were surprised at the extent to which this relationship showed up. Um, along, particularly along the East Coast, but um, yeah, so <coughs> that would be a fun paper to read. Okay, new directions on this topic. Um, and so driven seasonal characteristics of daily temperature and precipitation. So this is a new project I have with Sarah Larson here. Um, and um, our student Ian Gifford is going to be working on this with us as well. Uh, so. This asks two questions, really. Um, how does ENSO variability influence precipitation and temperature, including the mean, the daily statistics, and extremes over North America? And by ENSO variability, I mean uh, not just the strength of ENSO, but over the, the course of several hundred years, if you're, you're looking at um, a consistently weaker ENSO or asymmetrical, more La Niña's, more El Niño's. So, the reason that we, we wrote this proposal is if you spend enough time reading predictions, uh, reading projections about what will happen with ENSO, you don't get any clear picture. There are studies that say that ENSO is going to get stronger, it's going to get weaker, that we'll have extreme El Nino and very little La Nina, and vice versa. So this isn't a very clear picture. So. Uh, instead, we're going to look at all of those and not presuppose how ENSO is going to change, but instead uh, look at how those teleconnections will change in a future climate um, in the context of various ENSO, um, various ENSO characteristics. So this is uh, just a, an example from the proposal that Sarah put together to show some of the examples that we're, we're going to look at. All right, so that's new directions there. All right, moving on a little bit here, climate prediction. Uh, since the NMME has been uh, a major project that I've been working on since the beginning, um, you know, 12 years is a lot of work we've done on that. We've learned a lot of things. Um, and one of the primary questions we wanted to know is, uh, does multi-model ensemble theory hold in application? Uh, there, uh, there were a lot of studies done with multi-model ensembles um, in the 90s and the early, um, what do we call those, the 2000s, I guess, um, that were done with, with theoretical data sets. And while they demonstrated that multi-model ensembles produce better forecasts, we hadn't really verified this in reality. Um, so coming at this question from a, a couple of different directions, I mentioned that built-in evolution that NMME has. Um, we've, uh, we've gone through 17 models. We have two new ones coming online this year. Um, and so that is supposed to improve our forecast skill, but uh, supposed to doesn't always actually work out. So did it work out? And yes, we can say um, absolutely for temperature fields. Um, so 
this is there's a kind of a lot to digest in this, but uh, essentially we boiled down the NMMEs uh, phases to four different sets of models that roughly matched uh, four different sets over the last uh, 12 years. Uh, I, this study's two years old, so uh, I could do an NMME five now if I wanted to, but uh, we'll see. So <laughs> anyway. The point is the blue bar, which is the NMME's um, prediction skill at the, of the global uh, two meter temperature for uh, the seasonal forecast. Uh, we have seen a steady improvement in that we, and it is incremental. We have definitely not seen just, you know, leaps and bounds, but with each uh, each step we are actually stepping forward. So wherever that map on the top is blue means that the NMME that we had uh, two years ago was better than the NMME that we had in 2011. Uh, so there are some red spots, but it is much more, there's much more blue. Uh, so the only, uh, the only real kind of downer here is precip. We haven't really made any progress on that. Um, which is informative because maybe it means that whatever we're doing with our current models, resolution and so on, um, maybe we need to rethink that because um, even 17 models on, we're not seeing substantial uh, gains in global precip prediction. Uh, this is, uh, oh, apparently I put in two figures about the same thing. Uh, anyway, same question. Okay. So, yes, why is precip so high scoring here, even though these lines are? Uh, it's because it's global precip when you take into consideration tropical precip. Um, you have actually pretty decent prediction skill. I also did this just for land based, uh, and it, it's down here somewhere. So, uh, but anyway, this, this does uh, highlight the increase in temperature improvement uh, a little bit more clearly as we step up to the purple line, but also raises the question of are we plateauing um, over the, the last two evolutions we've seen on a small increase. So when you have a great big multi-model ensemble like this, you might want to ask what is the benefit from increased ensemble size? So. Uh, there are over 100 ensemble members in the real-time forecast. Um, how much benefit are we getting from that? It, the additional ability to characterize uh, uncertainty and to estimate probabilities. And what are we getting from model diversity? So um, each of these models that's built by a different modeling center, uh, there's, there are still quite a lot of uh, relationships between them, but uh, they are all looking at the problem from different perspectives. And this is uh, a study uh, Hoog van der Duel and I did back in 2016, um, looking at the reliability of forecasts for, this is a Northern, Hem Northern Hemisphere area aggregated two meter temperature. Uh, so reliability diagrams, just real quick, you, you look at the forecast probability and then you look back in time and you see how often that event actually happens. So if you have a 60% chance of above average, you want that to happen 60% of the time. You don't want it to happen 100% of the time because then your forecasts are, are unreliable. So that's a, a sort of nutshell version of what a reliability diagram shows. So this being the one-to-one -one line, if your forecasts fall on that line, then, uh, then they are reliable. In the case of being tipped forward, so this is a, uh, a forecast probability of about 70% only happens about 50% of the time, that is an overconfident forecast. So what we see here, this is just for the CFS version two, which has 24 ensemble members, conveniently. Uh, and then this is our, our mini NMME. So we took six on, uh, four ensemble members from six models to build a 24 member ensemble and we don't see we see a small improvement um, from that model diversity but then when you use the full NMME 
um, you improve reliability quite a lot. Uh, and this, this outcome changes depending on which um, variable you're looking at. For SST, in fact, we find that the impact of model variability um, is more important, for tropical SST, is more important than the ensemble size. Uh, so we can say that, uh, that both of these things are important, ensemble size and variability, or, and uh, model diversity. Okay, so can the NMME predict extremes? Um, and so far we've just looked at monthly and uh, seasonal extremes. The NMME is currently all um, monthly mean forecasts, so we don't have a, the daily resolution. Uh, that'd be nice to have. We have daily resolution for a couple of models, but uh, haven't had too much time to look into extremes in those. Uh, so, can the NMME predict those 90th percentile seasonal means? Um, 90th, 95th percentile, depending. Uh, so on the top we've got, for maximum temperature, uh, the SETI is a symmetric extremal dependence index. It's basically a hit rate uh, statistic that's uh, normalized by the false alarm rate. So it's better to use for extremes. And the fact that we've got some coverage on this map uh, indicates to us that yes, there is some potential for successful prediction of extremes. Um, and let me tell you, uh, the, the general public, emergency managers, everybody, what they really are interested in is the a heads up on extremes. Um, so we do have some potential for that. And an example, that has gone into uh, real-time production at uh, NOAA's PSL is a prediction of marine heat waves, so those extremes in uh, sea surface temperature. And this, uh, this is a, they've, they've done a beautiful job with this, uh, just the graphics for this, but it gives you the probability based on the NMME of those extremes in sea surface temperature. All right. Just a few minutes left. I'm going to talk about some of the new projects. As I said, uh, Ben on Friday will have more details about a few of these. Um, and uh, just wanted to talk about some of the ones that I'm involved with here. So first is predictability of subseasonal to interannual coastal flood risk. This is fun because it's an entirely new bunch of people working on it. Uh, that image is my uh, hometown, Annapolis, which has a tendency to flood all the time, much like uh, Virginia Key, so uh, something that we have in common here. Uh, so the point is to diagnose the monthly to seasonal to interannual sources and mechanisms of predictability uh, from internal climate variability, uh, including uh, changes in the Florida current and other ocean currents. And then to develop a prototype system for this information. Um, so, sort of like the, the NME predictions that we have had available for the last 12 years, can we use NME information uh, from winds and sea level pressure and so on, um, and potentially those indices such as, as ENSO to create uh, a flood prediction system. Um, and it's also, there's, a, there's another project that we're we're currently involved with that is coming at this same question from a more statistical hybrid model approach. So there's a lot of action in this. It's a new new topic for me and, and I, I find it very interesting. So I'm excited to be working on that. Okay, and then also stretching the time scale. So what I've what I've done so far mostly has ended one or two years out, um, but we have a new project where we are looking out 50 years into the future, developing uh, projection services, so actionable information on those decadal time scales. Um, our side of the project, ours being um, a University of Miami-led, but, oh, I skipped to this one, sorry. There we go, I wanna go backwards, since I've already got the momentum talking about this one. Uh, it's led by University of Miami, but it's a, a collaborative project. We've got partners at NCAR, CSU, and FIU. Um, 
and several people here from the University of Miami. So our point here is to assess, quantify, and reduce uncertainty um, and identify large-scale drivers of projected changes. Fortunately, this is a, a four to four and a half year to five year project um, because we have a lot of different things we'd like to do, but um, no, well, we're just getting started. Hopefully we'll get started soon. Uh, so the plan is to develop hyper-local. This is a real, um, a real specific focus here rather than just general global information, but really dig down into the predictability um, that is available and necessary for local impacts. Um, and we have a case study, or a case study is exactly the right word, but a, um, we have some individual projects planned that will be used as prototypes. Okay, sorry, just have skipped around here um, because these are related projects. This is also um, those decadal scale, but it's connecting subseasonal to seasonal to decadal because uh, a lot of things change when you're moving in between those those time scales. So, what are the the sources of predictability, uh, particularly for extremes on these time scales, and and also a comparison of um, of initialized to uninitialized projections. I borrowed that figure from uh, Season Chaos down there at the bottom. The bridge in there, this is the point there, is the bridge between weather and climate. But the, this concept of bridging between these time scales is something that um, we, as a, as a science, haven't spent a whole lot of time working on. But it's really important to connect those different time scales. OK. so. This is where I'm ending here. Um, cartoon from the ENSO blog showing, uh, this was developed to illustrate uh, inherent variability versus a strong forcing being present. Uh, so you know, your path wanders around when you have no real strong predictors, uh, but when you've got a strong predictor like uh, ENSO, or maybe there's a bear in your path, you're going to make a strong deviation. Uh, and that may be more predictable. So, all right, thank you all very much. Bravo, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Emily, Amazing. for that great talk. And thanks to everyone in the audience for coming to Compass today. Does anyone have any questions for Emily? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, 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 what, what's, your, what's your thoughts for improving preset predictions? Oh, yeah, I, I think we need to look into the resolution question for sure. <laughs> the resolution of the models, I, I think that's where we should start, honestly. That's a simplistic answer, but I don't think we spend any time really on that, and I think that's where it's worth a try, yeah. Does anything need weights members depending on where and when they perform better than the others? Yeah, that is a very, very important question. The answer is no. And the reason we don't do it is because um, nobody, despite many, many, many studies, has been able to establish a, a rigorous weighting scheme that actually improves forecasts in real time. You can come up with something that improves your forecasts that you're basing that system on, but then when you go into the future, uh, your model that was good is suddenly the model that's not good. So uh, most, most uh, multi-model ensemble systems don't use a weighting system, um, and it's for that reason, because you don't really ever know which one's going to be better. Probably need hundreds of years of forecasting. Yeah, uh, who did a calculation approximately 5,000 years? So, yeah. Uh, Quentin, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was really intrigued, um, so you talked about the precip forecasts. Um, and so following up on that question, is there like a regionality to like the lack of skill? You kind of mentioned land, but is there like a specific part of the world where um, the MME is yeah. just not improving? Yeah, um, another great question. Essentially, I would say anywhere that there is not an ENSO teleconnection, <laughs> um, there is very little precip predictability. Um, 
in certain seasons, uh, for example, in the southern plains in the summer, you have a strong land surface feedback. Um, and that actually, uh, the NMME, the various models captured that pretty well and they have slightly improved. Uh, it's, it's sort of undetectable in those global averages I was showing, but there, there are, in places where there was some predictability, there have been very small increases in that. Does it pick up on like MJO? Or um, not too much. Um, I, I would guess, this is actually something that I don't know if anybody's looked at, but on the, that zero leads, so the forecasts are made on the first of the month and out for that, that month's average. Um, I suspect there there would be some dependence on the MJO in that, but beyond that, no. Um, Jafid had a question. No, yes, uh, Emily, the, the evolution of the MME has it at all been influenced by whether it predicts better uh, the climate in the areas where the institutions that develop those models are located? <laughs> <laughs> it's, we're laughing because like the, the Canadian models just keep doing worse at North America and <laughs> and so on. So um, you would think so, but no. Um, I, oddly enough, the prediction of North America is one of the weakest for both temperature and precip. Um, and all of our models, of course, come from North America. So if there's a signal to that, we have not been able to detect it yet. I would add, though, hmm. um, the ENSO teleconnection in the southeast U.S., CFS mm. didn't do a very good job of it. And when we added the multi-model, the model that we're running does a really good job in the southeast U.S. So there was mm. a... There we go. That was fortuitous. There's your sure signal. Model. It's random chance, but there's your signal. <laughs> yeah. now why is your coastal flooding forecast so good compared to all the other things you've discussed today? Um, well, oh, you mean what I showed of Mary, Mary Beth, the paper of Mary Beth wrote? Yeah, you showed a figure with uh, various tide gauges. <laughs> Do you want to take that question? <laughs> it, it, yeah, because it's not a forecast. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it, it's, okay. it's really good at looking back in time. Yes. Um, yeah, It was exactly. just looking. John, we've become concept. really good at predicting the 1982-83 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's a diagnostic. Okay. That's why those bars were higher than than most of the other bars, but that's because they were diagnostics, yeah. And there's a strong correlation between um, upwelling and downwelling favorable winds locally and coastal flooding. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible if you could forecast the winds yep. to do a pretty good job. And, and so an MJO have a strong relationship with those winds, so yeah. Yeah, it made sense. Amy. Um, I'm reading this book right now by Tim Palmer called The Primacy of Doubt, and he's you know talking about ensemble forecasting and the weather problem, and basically showing that models you know on that for that problem models are are um, overconfident. So you need a large ensemble in order to get like you know what happened might actually go far off what like mm -hmm. any one model will predict. But then you go out to the longer time scale, and models seem to be underconfident. In other words, there's a lot more like signal mm -hmm. than there is noise. You have to knock down the noise. <laughs> so I just, oh no, you probably like. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. On, you mentioned the going across time scales, and I'm wondering, like, do you think about things in that way, like the role of signal and noise, and how those could be such like really like fundamentally different problems and different problems of model. Yes, absolutely, and it has it has changed a lot over the last couple of decades as the models have evolved. Um, and in fact, what what we found out um, there's a, a study I, I didn't show from earlier, but um, the the seasonal models are almost the sweet spot in terms of um, of the dispersiveness matching what you would expect from nature. Um, so. Yeah, that, that'll be really interesting to see how that, that translates to those longer time scales. Yeah. How's that book? Um, it's, it's good. I, I you know, it's, it's interesting history of the ensemble forecast and yeah. Yeah. Um, a very particular view of it, so it's worth reading. Yeah, I think so. It has a great title, too. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I can't argue with that. Very bad. Oh, sorry. 
So uh, you had mentioned with the preset that maybe the high resolution could help increase the skill there. But for say the SST that kind of increased and then plateaued, mm -hmm. do you think that we're reaching some sort of limit of predictability? Or is that also maybe model dependent? Yeah, uh, Ben and I have talked about this. I, I think I think I could be, uh, with our current generation of models and the, the current resolution, I think we may well be reaching to the max of what we can expect from these relatively coarse resolution uh, models. So. But, I don't know. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, also regarding precipitation. Um, okay, I'm, I'm interested in precipitation at a few volcanoes to see, mm. okay, thinking that they might trigger once in a while by precipitation, particularly in the, in the, in the Galapagos. So for the last 20 years, we have, of course, um, um, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, but then I would like to go back uh, using El Nino mm. to predict how much, well, retroactively predict how much uh, precipitation there was. Do you have any advice on how to do that? So, is it possible to get to use a previous El Nino, well, the El Nino up to 2000 or something like that, the El Nino information we have to get some little bit more precise ideas about the precipitation in that area? Uh, Yes, probably. Uh, El Nino has a really strong relationship with Precip and the Galapagos, and we've got very good El Nino observations back to 1950 and somewhat less um, reliable. So you would just use El Nino? I might even try yeah, that, yeah. SSC just, just look at that relationship. Okay, yeah. that works away for what I look at. Oh, is that, that's not what you're. Or no, no, that's what I'm, try where oh. I'm trying, yes, but it okay. doesn't work so well. Right? Ah. Okay. But I might, I might look Maybe there's something more. Huh, I'll have to think about that. That's, that's very interesting. <coughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, so for the high resolution of precipitation, do you think that topography resolution would have kind of an impact there? Um, we see a lot of the, the local topography uh, impacting hyperlocal precipitation and really affecting the signals. So I'm just curious, you know, as you get to a smaller grid size, you're also really resolving the finer scale topography yeah. better. Um, I think that would be very important. Uh, one of the reasons the precip forecasts look so terrible in verification is because if it's predicted to rain in one grid cell and it rains in the other one, uh, the water is going to the same basin, but uh, you, you get a zero in your prediction. So, um, yes, would be my answer to that. Uh, that's that would be interesting to look into. Right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you again, Thanks Emily. <laughs>